Welcome to everyone for our call to worship this evening. I want to read from the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 22, verses 1 to 5. Revelation 22, verses 1 to 5. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were, were for the healing of the nations, and there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp, nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Amen. Well, please turn with me in your Trinity hymnal to hymn number 26. Hymn number 26, we'll stand and sing together the first tune. be seated. Well, let us pray. Our God and our Father, we thank you for this Lord's Day. We thank you for this opportunity to come again into your house. We ask that you would be glorified and honored in our meeting here tonight. We know that you command your creatures, your, uh, your saints specifically, to come before you in an acceptable manner and to do so with godly reverence and with fear. For you are a consuming fire. Help us to consider the fact that you are holy and glorious and wondrous and worthy to be praised and honored. We know as well that this reverence, this godly fear is consistent with joy. So give us hearts that are full of joy, full of rejoicing over the glorious truth that God has reconciled us unto himself through his beloved son, even the Lord Jesus Christ. May these things truly stir us up to come before you with thanksgiving to come before you with these psalms and these hymns, 
as well, God, help us to receive with thanksgiving the word of truth tonight. We ask that you would be in the presence of your people here, that your Holy Spirit would be at work in our hearts and in our minds, that we would, by your grace, make much of our Lord Jesus Christ and of his gospel, and help us to receive the, the, the truth as we consider Paul's letter to Timothy tonight. May you stir us up to endurance and to perseverance in our Christian life. We know there are many who start, many who make a profession at the, at the outset, but there are only those who know your grace and who know your mercy that persevere to the very end. We thank you that the one who begins a good work in us will complete it unto the day of Jesus Christ. We thank you for sovereign grace. We thank you for your uh, plan to save a people from their sins by the Lord Jesus Christ. And you are assembling this church from, from all over the earth. And so we praise you for this. We ask tonight that the gospel would be proclaimed throughout the various nations in this world. We pray that as the psalmist said, you would cause your face to shine upon the nations. That you would send forth your glorious truth. And God, we know and we are assured with the prophet Isaiah that the word of God does not return to you void. It always accomplishes the purpose for which you send it. And we pray that you would be pleased to turn men and women and boys and girls from their idols to the true and living God. We pray that you would be pleased to save sinners, that they would see themselves before a holy God, and they would see that Christ alone saves to the uttermost all who draw nigh unto God through him. We pray that this gospel would be proclaimed and that it would run swiftly and be glorified. We ask that you would encourage the brothers and sisters in other nations that suffer for the cause of God and truth. We know there are a multitude in prison. We know there are those who have been dispossessed from homes and business. We know, God, there are those who have been dispossessed from their own homeland. And we just commit them to you and to the word of your grace and pray that you would look with favor upon your saints. That you would surround them with your protection. Cause them to press on, even in the midst of trial and difficulty, and cause them to know the joy of being found in the Lord Jesus. We pray for those who are steeped in false religion, that the powerful word of the living and true God would come to them. As the psalmist says, the, the voice of the Lord shatters the cedars of Lebanon. Certainly your heart is able to, to, to shatter the hardened hearts of men. And we pray that you would do this for your glory's sake and for the increase of your kingdom and of the building up of your holy church. We ask that you would look with favor upon the Neufelds. We pray for Don, that he would in fact get the surgery today and that he would be feeling better physically and that you would just give this brother grace to rejoice in the Lord God Most High. For others in our congregation with physical needs, we pray that you would minister unto them. And the way that you know how, the way that you are able to, we pray that you would bless them richly. And God, for all of us, we come in out of the world and we all have spiritual battles. We all have spiritual struggles and trials and temptations and difficulties. We ask that you would lead us not into temptation, but you would deliver us from the evil one. That you would keep us and protect us and watch over us. Cause us to use the means that you've ordained. Cause us to be in our Bibles and to be in prayer and to be in church, to be in fellowship one with another. Father, we know that you have blessed these things for the good of your, of your people. So help us not to neglect them. Help us not to, to, to stay away from these wonderful things that you've afforded to the life of your people. We ask God that you would encourage our hearts and strengthen us with might in the inner man and cause us to leave from this place having met with you and cause us to go into this world to shine as lights in a crooked and perverse generation and give us boldness and courage to hold forth the word of truth. And our Father, we pray that you would forgive us for all of our sins and transgressions as we look into your holy law, as we hear the words of the apostles, we see that our conduct needs to be worthy of the gospel. And we confess our sin and transgression. We know our, our, our lives do not always manifest this profession of faith. We know that our lives do not always manifest what Jesus says in the upper room. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. So God, cleanse us in the blood of the Lord Jesus. Wash us and purify us and help us, God, to pursue those things which are pleasing in your sight. And for any and all who have come here tonight that are not Christians, 
those who are not in Christ, those who have not believed the gospel. We pray that you would give them ears to hear and a heart to receive the truth tonight. That, Father, you would be well pleased to cause this to be the day of salvation. And may sinners turn from their, from their, their, their ways and may they embrace the offered mercy in the Lord Jesus Christ. And God, we ask these things for your glory and we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, please turn with me again in your Trinity hymnal to number 457. 457, we'll stand as we sing. Please turn to the prophet Jeremiah chapter 32 for our scripture reading this evening. Jeremiah chapter 32. It's a long chapter, so we'll read verses 1 to 15. Jeremiah chapter 32. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the tenth year of Zedekiah, king of Judah, which was the eighteenth year of Nebuchadnezzar. For then the king of Babylon's army besieged Jerusalem, and Jeremiah the prophet was shut up in the court of the prison, which was in the king of Judah's house. For Zedekiah, king of Judah, had shut him up, saying, Why do you prophesy and say, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will give this city into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall take it. And Zedekiah, king of Judah, shall not escape from the hand of the Chaldeans, but shall surely be delivered into the hand of the king of Babylon, and shall speak with him face to face, and see him eye to eye. Then he shall lead Zedekiah to Babylon, and there he shall be until I visit him, says the Lord. Though you fight with the Chaldeans, you shall not succeed. 
And Jeremiah said, The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Behold, Hanamel, the son of Shalom, your uncle, will come to you, saying, Buy my field which is in Anathoth, for the right of redemption is yours to buy it. Then Hanamel, my uncle's son, came to me in the court of the prison according to the word of the Lord, and said to me, Please buy my field that is in Anathoth, which is in the country of Benjamin. For the right of inheritance is yours, and the redemption yours. Buy it for yourself. Then I knew that this was the word of the Lord. So I bought the field from Hanamel, the son of my uncle who was in Anathoth, and weighed out to him the money, 17 shekels of silver. And I signed the deed and sealed it, took witnesses and weighed the money on the scales. So I took the purchase deed, both that which was sealed according to the law and custom, and that which was open. And I gave the purchase deed to Baruch, the son of Neriah, son of Maseah, in the presence of Hanamel, my uncle's son, and in the presence of the witnesses who signed the purchase deed, before all the Jews who sat in the court of the prison. Then I charged Baruch before them, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Take these deeds, both this purchase deed which is sealed and this deed which is open, and put them in an earthen vessel that they may last many days. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Houses and fields and vineyards shall be possessed again in this land. Amen. A bit of an interesting passage here, Jeremiah is told to purchase a field. If you're tracking with the flow of the book, this doesn't seem like the best idea in light of a Babylonian invasion. When Nebuchadnezzar and the uh, Babylonians have come to sack Jerusalem to destroy the temple, I'm no real estate expert, but that seems like the least wise time to purchase property in a land that will be besieged by a foreign army. But this is a sign from God concerning what has been announced several times throughout the prophet Jeremiah. This is a symbol, a sign, a particular uh, a reality that Jeremiah was to engage in to serve as a token of God's faithfulness to his word. The children of Israel would be besieged, or the city rather would be besieged. The children of Israel would be led into captivity. It would be, however, for 70 years. There was a cap on this. And after that 70 years, the children of Judah would return to their land. They would return to their property. They would return to their possessions. So the instruction to Jeremiah to purchase this particular field was a token of God's faithfulness that, in fact, there would be fields, there would be lands, there would be property in Judah once again. When the Lord God had indeed chastened his people, when that 70-year period was over, they would be restored, and they would come back, and they would, again, rebuild the city, and they would rebuild the temple. And certainly that's what Ezra and Nehemiah, uh, those are, those are post-exilic men, and then the prophets Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. Those were the men that came after the Babylonian exile, after the captivity, when the Judahites returned to their land. So the whole chapter, or rather this whole section, illustrates a token or gives a token concerning God's faithfulness to his people. Well, let us pray. Our Father, we thank you that you are faithful and that when you promise, you make good on those things. We ask that you would cause us to walk according to these things, help us to have our faith strengthened. Every page of Scripture testifies that God is faithful. As we've been reading in the book of Hebrews, we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, and each one of them testifies that God is faithful. All that we see around us ascribes to this reality as well. And we ask that you would increase our faith and give us grace, Most High God, to take you at your word and to realize that you will never renege on promises and that you have indeed taught our hearts to fear and that you will in fact keep us unto that blessed day. And we pray these things through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, you may turn in your Trinity Psalter to Psalm 63. Psalm 63, again, will stand as we sing together.
please be seated. You can turn in your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Our focus tonight is verses 11 to 13. I do, however, want to read the chapter, pray, and then remind us of what's going on in the particular context. 2 Timothy chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. And also, if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he compete, competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer must be first to partake of the crops. Consider what I say, and may the Lord give you understanding in all things. Remember that Jesus Christ, of the seed of David, was raised from the dead according to my gospel, for which I suffer trouble as an evildoer even to the point of chains. But the word of God is not chained. Therefore, I endure all things for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. This is a faithful saying, for if we died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. Remind them of these things, charging them before the Lord, not to strive about words to no profit, to the ruin of the hearers. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who do does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness and their message will spread like cancer. Hymenaeus and Philetus are of this sort, who have strayed concerning the truth, saying that the resurrection has already passed, and they over overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands, having this seal. The Lord knows those who are his, and let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Flee also youthful lusts, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance, so that they may know the truth, and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive, uh, being taken captive, uh, by him to do his will. Amen. Well, let us pray. Father, again, we thank you for the scriptures, and we pray now for the Spirit to guide us as we study your holy word. Help us to learn the lessons that Paul has for Timothy here. Help us to see their application, not only to a minister in the first century, but to ministers in the 21st century, and as well to all of God's people. For certainly the command to be strong and the command to endure or share in hardship is something that every Christian participates in. Paul says later that all those who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Lord, help us to persevere. As we consider this doctrine tonight, as we consider this passage of Scripture, give us wisdom and give us grace and give us help to do those things that you call us to do. Thank you that your spirit does work in us, both to will and to do, for your good pleasure. And we pray now through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, as we have seen in many respects in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8, where the apostle tells Timothy 
Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God. In many ways, that verse controls or is the theme for everything that follows from chapter 1 all the way through the end of chapter 2. Timothy is to show loyalty, first and foremost, to the testimony of the Lord. He is to be faithful with reference to the gospel. He is not to compromise. He is not to add works. He is not to take away from it. He is not to supplement the truth of God. He is rather to maintain fidelity to the testimony of our Lord. Later on in chapter 2, as we read, we'll see God willing in the weeks to come. He tells Timothy in verse 15, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. In other words, Timothy is not to be looking for the applause of men. He is not to be looking to be the, the most popular preacher in Ephesus. It is not celebrity status that Timothy is to pursue, but rather it is fidelity to the living God. He is to seek approval, not from men, but rather from God Most High. So according to 1.8, Timothy is to be a loyal servant with reference to the testimony of the Lord Jesus. As well, Timothy is to show faithfulness and commitment to the Apostle Paul. Notice in verse 8, he says, Nor of me, do not be ashamed of me, his prisoner. And Timothy is to share with Paul in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God. And then we consider chapter 2. Notice in verse 1, Therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. This is God's will. This is God's revealed will for each and every one of us. Again, it's not just for Pastor Timothy in the church in Ephesus in the first century. It is for pastors today, to be sure, but it is for all of us. We are to be strong. We're not to lie down. We're not to give up. We are not to roll over, but rather we are to overcome. We are to press on. We are to endure. We are to persevere. And that leads Paul to tell Timothy very specifically in verse 3. You therefore must endure hardship. Literally, you must share with me in hardship, Paul tells Timothy. And so we have the command, we have the imperative, we have the duty, we have what God wants from each of us. Be strong, endure hardship. And because God is good, because God is kind, and because God truly does desire his people to live in a manner that is consistent with his revealed will, he gives us three incentives. He gives us three reasons why, or three things that we ought to consider so that it helps us to endure hardship. In other words, when you are going through those trials, when you are going through those difficulties, don't just tune out, don't just not think, don't just give up, don't just roll over, but rather when you are enduring those hardships, the first thing you ought to do is contemplate Christ. You ought to contemplate our Lord Jesus. And that is precisely what Paul says in verse 8. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. So while you're enduring hardship, what are you doing? You're remembering the Son of God. You are remembering the Son of David. You are remembering the Lord Jesus in his incarnation. The fact that Paul says that he was raised from the dead indicates or presupposes the betrayal, the trial, and the, the death or the suffering of our Lord Jesus. But he was raised from that. And then a second incentive or a second thing we ought to consider as we endure hardship is the conduct of Paul. Notice what Paul says in verses 9 and 10. For which gospel I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even to the point of chains, but the word of God is not chained. Therefore I endure all things for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. You see Paul's logic. Timothy, I want you to endure hardship. And while you're enduring hardship, I want you to remember Jesus. I want you to contemplate the Savior. I want you to consider what he went through. He left heaven above. He took on the likeness of, sin, uh, of man. He took on our flesh. He did not sin, but rather he assumed humanity. 
to the second person of the glorious Trinity, and he suffered, and he died, and he was raised the third day. Timothy, as you're enduring hardship, you think through that. And Timothy, as you're enduring hardship, think about me, Paul says. Think about what I've gone through. We saw this last week, 2 Corinthians 11. You think you have a tough time being a Christian? You think it's difficult in your workplace? You think your family is nasty or unkind or, or, or vicious to you? Just read 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and see what the Apostle Paul endured for the cause of our Lord Jesus. And Paul, doesn't, or Paul does it for the sake of the elect. Paul does it for the furtherance of the gospel. Paul does it for the expansion of the kingdom of Christ. Paul does it for the church. He is truly others-minded. And so when he tells Timothy, endure hardship, as a good soldier of Christ Jesus, you need to remember Jesus and you need to remember Paul's conduct. But in the third place, another reason is the communion that we have with Christ. And this is what I think verses 11 to 13 indicate. We're to contemplate Jesus. We're to consider him in his incarnation. He is the seed of David. We're to consider him in his crucifixion because he was raised the third day. We're to consider him in all of his glory and his majesty. But we are to recognize that currently, presently, right now, according to verses 11 and 12, we have communion with Christ. We have fellowship with Christ. If you are called upon to endure hardship, you are not called upon to endure it alone. You are not called to go it alone. You are not called to, to just knuckle under or stiffen up your lip and, and just bear with it. We have present, vibrant, real communion with the Lord Jesus Christ himself. We are to endure hardship with the remembrance of this reality. So let's look at verses 11 to 13. In the first place, Paul ascribes this to a faithful saying. Notice in 2.11, he says, this is a faithful saying. This is one of several in the epistles of Paul to Timothy and to Titus. There's one in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. It's a faithful saying that Christ Jesus came into the world sinners to save. Sometimes you may hear Pastor Porter refer to it that way, or, my, or, or myself. That's where the emphasis lies. Sinners to save. Sinners, not upright, positive, well-adjusted persons. The glory of the Christian gospel, according to 1 Timothy 1.15, is that Christ Jesus came into the world, sinners to save. And when Paul goes on, he says, of whom I am chief. You ought never to convince yourself that you are too far gone to be a candidate for salvation. The grace of God is powerful. The grace of God is glorious. The grace of God is is sovereign. And Paul was a, uh, 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 yes, Paul specifically was a, a recipient as he was in the act of persecuting the church of the living God. There's a faithful saying in chapter 3, verse 1 of 1 Timothy, if a man desires the office of bishop, this is a good thing. This is a faithful saying. 4, 9, bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things. This is a faithful saying. And then we have this faithful saying, and then one further in Titus chapter 3 at verse 8. Titus 3, 8, this is a faithful saying, and these things I want you to affirm constantly. I think as Paul uses this particular phrase, it's sort of a way to underline, it's sort of a way to highlight, it's sort of a way to draw attention to what he is going to say. And I suspect these were faithful sayings that were in common understanding among the churches of Christ in the first century. In other words, what Paul does in verses 11 to 13 is remind them of something they already knew. Paul tells Timothy, endure hardship. And here's another incentive, another reason, another thing to help you in the midst of suffering. And I think the actual saying is broken down into two sections. First, the word of encouragement, and secondly, the word of warning. First, the word of encouragement in verses 11b to 12a. Note first, the believer's union with Christ. This is a glorious thing. Imagine if you were in a prison somewhere, let's say on the other side of the world, and you were suffering grievously, and you were not a Christian, 
would be difficult to endure without some token, without some indicator that it was going to end, right? I mean, imagine being in a, in, a, in a horrible situation and having no evidence, no idea whatsoever that this was ever going to end. We don't have that as Christians. No matter how bad things may get, no matter how bad things may be, no matter how grim everything around, uh, around us appears, we have present communion with the living Christ. And this is precisely what Paul emphasizes in the first part of verse 11, uh, in 11 here. He says, for if we died with him, we shall also live with him. Now some commentators take this as a reference to martyrdom. If we die in martyrdom, we will be raised again by the power of the gospel. I don't think that's what's meant here. I think that's true, to be sure, but I think Paul's emphasis here is on union with Christ that takes place at conversion. We die with him, and we are raised in him. So why ought you to endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ? Because you died, in your, or you died to sin, and you're alive to God in Christ Jesus. I think a parallel to verse 11 is in Romans chapter 6, specifically at verse 8. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. This is union. This is communion. This is what we have as believers with our Lord. We are alive in him. We are positionally uh, reconciled to him. Notice in 2 Corinthians 5.14. In other words, what Paul is doing is giving you items with reference to your salvation that you are to focus upon so that you may endure hardship. When you are going through hardship, what is the most helpful tonic for your soul? It is the truth of the gospel. It is the truth of God's saving benefits. It is the truth of the ordo salutis, the application of the redemptive benefits that Jesus Christ has secured for all of his elect. Notice in 2 Corinthians 5.14, for the love of Christ compels us, because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. It may not even be hardship that you're going through. It might just be some difficulties in your life. Do you panic? Do you fret? Do you throw up your hands and say, forget it, I'm done, it's over? You've died, and you have been raised again. You are in Christ. You have a present possession in the Savior. He holds you, and by God's grace, you hold him. There is absolutely no reason why any believer ought to get to the point where they're throwing up their hands and saying, forget it, I've tried, it hasn't worked, I'm going to go back to the city of destruction. No, you've died, and you've been raised again, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. That's what Colossians 3.3 says. Colossians 2.12 emphasizes this as well. We died with him, we've been raised with him. And so Paul to Timothy says, you need to endure hardship. You need to consider the fact that you have been converted. You have been brought out of darkness into marvelous light. You have been saved by grace. These things that weren't true of you are now true of you. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. You were alienated from God. You were at enmity to God. You resisted God. You raised your fist to God. And then God in his grace saved you. God in his grace humbled you. God in his grace granted you the faith to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So while you're enduring hardship, consider the fact that you're alive. You are alive in the Lord Jesus and you have present communion and union with the blessed Lord. What does Paul say in Galatians 2.20? The life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and who gave himself for me. That's what we have. That's what we ponder. That's what we consider. Consider the fact that when you're undergoing hardship, the best thing you can set your mind and heart to is the reality that Christ is yours, that you are Christ's. Notice, secondly, by way of encouragement, he says, if we died with him, we shall also live with him. I call that the believer's union with Christ. Notice in verse 12a, the believer's 
perseverance in Christ if we endure. And this is the crux, isn't it? This is the context. This is the point. This is what it's all about if we endure. Timothy, endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Timothy, be disciplined like that athlete who trains his body who gets up early, who goes to bed early, who foregoes the feasts and the parties so that he can buffet his body and bring it into subjection so that he can win the athlete's crown. Timothy, be like that diligent farmer, that hardworking farmer who labors, who waters, who feeds, who gets up early, who stays up late. That's something I've always thought. If you think your job is hard, look at a farmer. They're married to their farm. They're married to their cows. They're married to their chickens. They can't just go away. How do you just go away when you have 50 cows that need to be dealt with? You have to get somebody there to watch them. Farming is difficult. It's no surprise that Paul utilizes this as an example for diligence. We've got the, 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 the or I'm sorry, the, the, the diligence rather, or the devotion rather of the soldier, the discipline of the athlete, and the diligence of the farmer. He says, you need to be that, Timothy. You need to endure hardship. And here, very specifically, he speaks of the saint's endurance or perseverance. The path, or rather, the emphasis and the context is on endurance. And the endurance that the Christian is to evidence is endurance in and for the cause of Christ. Matthew 10, verse 22. A couple of passages to flesh this out. Matthew 10, verse 22, and you will be hated for all by my name, or you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end will be saved. You say, Pastor Butler, you're reformed. Don't you believe that God saves sinners? Don't you believe that as you continue reading in the prophet Jeremiah in 32, God says that he will, he will put his fear, or put the fear of him into their hearts, and he will cause them not to depart from his ways? Doesn't Philippians 1.6 say, He who began a good work in you will complete it unto the day of Christ? Don't you Calvinisms talk, uh, Calvinists talk about eternal security and once saved, always saved? Don't you Calvinists trump the, the, the fifth point of Calvinism, which is perseverance of the saints? Yes, it's perseverance of the saints. It's preservation by God. It is the fear put in our hearts by God. It is secure and stable because of God, but nevertheless, the Christian is to endure. He is to persevere. God calls us to run with endurance the race that is set before us. God doesn't save us and say, now you can lay on your couch and you can eat Doritos and you can watch Oprah and you can just float your way into heaven. This, unfortunately, is the view that some people maintain. God saves us. God warns us, God exhorts us, God commands us to run with endurance. Paul puts it in a conditional sentence here. If we endure, then we shall reign. What's the implication? If we don't endure, we'll never reign. Now we know from the rest of the Bible, if we don't endure, it's because we never believe the gospel to begin with. Those, however, who believe by the grace of God will be about endurance. They will be about perseverance. They will not give up. They will not throw in the towel. I realize there are times, there are seasons, there is depression, there is melancholy, there is collapsing under the burden and weight of trial. There is weeping, and there is woe, and there is distress. But the man or woman of God gets up. By the grace of God, they get up. They endure, they persevere, because he who began this good work in you will complete it under the day of Christ. If you give up and you never get up, it's because you were never saved to begin with. This is John's statement in 1 John 2, 19. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they were of us, they would not have gone out from us. John teaches eternal security. Paul teaches eternal security. The Bible teaches eternal security. The Bible teaches the preservation by God. The Bible teaches the perseverance of the saints. 
The Bible teaches in Romans 8, there is nothing that shall separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. But that saying, God has given us the Spirit such that the Apostle Paul in Philippians 2 can capture the dynamic that's involved in our sanctification, which is an aspect of our perseverance and endurance. In Philippians 2, 12, Paul says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence always, but now much more in my absence. Don't you love that? Don't you love what Paul says? You, as you've always obeyed, not as in my presence only. The Philippians weren't the kind of people that said, Paul's coming, look busy. I suspect sometimes little children are like this. They hear mom running up the stairs. Okay, I'm going to start cleaning my room now. I'm going to start doing what I'm supposed to do. I'm going to start doing what I was commanded to do. The Philippians weren't like that. You see, the saint of Christ doesn't need Paul's presence to do what's right. The saint of Christ doesn't need a lot of external coercion to do what's right. The saint of Christ shouldn't require the type of nagging that oftentimes goes on with reference to the saints of Christ. The saints of Christ want to obey Christ, and Paul commends the believers in Philippi for this very thing. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You've got to understand what Paul is saying. He's not saying work for your salvation. We work out what God has graciously deposited. We work out what God has already caused to happen. We're not working for salvation. We're not trying to complete the finished work of Jesus. We're not trying to add to it. We're not trying to supplement it. But the idea is, is that when God saves a soul, when God changes that heart, when God does what God alone can do, and now the sinner believes on the Lord Jesus Christ, he repents from his sins, he enters a battle. You remember Pilgrim's Progress? I love the banner edition, that hardback version. It shows Christian at the cross, and he's at the foot, and the burden is flying off of his back. It's a beautiful depiction, isn't it? We come to the cross, and our burden is gone. It's gone. Our sin, oh the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. But you know, at that cross, we do take on a yoke. Jesus says this, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. We come and he gives us rest. He says, take my yoke upon you. It's an easy yoke, it's a, it's a light burden, but you see the idea is, is that when we come from the cross, having been justified freely by his grace, we enter the life of sanctification. We're not to continue in sin. Jesus came to save us from our sin. And part of that whole aspect, sanctification to be sure, but perseverance. You see, at times it seems as if we as Christians say, you know, I'm pretty battle weary, I, I just, just want to lay down. Now, God gives us Sabbath rest. He's good, right? There are seasons in the life of the soldier where a little bit of rest will do him a world of good, right? Come apart and rest a while, Jesus says to his disciples. But you can't rest forever. You've got to run. You've got to endure. You've got to persevere. The imagery that Paul uses with reference to Timothy are those three metaphors. Soldiers, soldiers are devoted. Athletes are disciplined. I mean, really, could you be an Olympic athlete? You really want to live that way? <laughs> you really want to go through that? That's your calling in life to train your body? To neglect every comfort or everything out there that, that, that would bring you pleasure? You know, to measure out your nutrients, to get your macros in, to get all that, to exercise to the point where you win that crown. And a farmer. Maybe the farmer isn't as, as difficult in, you know, today as it was in Paul's day. But I've also thought this too, you know, the hardworking farmers. I'm not picking on farmers, but you know, driving around in an air-conditioned tractor, that's probably a whole lot better than what Paul had in mind. Okay? I'm not you know, belittling. I, I have the greatest amount of respect for farmers. 
They do things I, I, I don't do, and that's an amazing thing. But however, the farmers in Paul's day probably were a little bit more, you know, rugged than the farmers in our day. You know, listening to talk radio, you know, in your tractor for 12 hours, you at least know what's going on in the world in the political sphere. But you see, Paul says in verse 12, if we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. You say, but you said this whole section is considered the communion with Christ. I love what our confession says concerning this doctrine of perseverance. Chapter 2, or I'm sorry, chapter 17, paragraph 2. This perseverance of the saints depends not upon their own free will. This is talking about the reality that it's actually successful. Okay? In the first paragraph, it talks about the saints needing to do what they're supposed to do. But in the second paragraph, this perseverance of the saints depends not upon their own free will, but upon the immutability of the decree of election flowing from the free and unchangeable love of God the Father upon the efficacy of, of the merit and intercession of Jesus Christ and union with him, the oath of God, the abiding of his spirit, and the seed of God within them, and the nature of the covenant of grace from all which arises also the certainty and infallibility thereof. We are to go forward upon the efficacy of the merit and the intercession of Jesus Christ and union with him. You see, endure hardship in vital communion and union with our Lord Jesus. If we ask the question of verse 12, hey, how do we endure? I've already said you need to not just give up. And brethren, let me just say to you, I know what it is to want to give up. I, I remember pacing this room, autobiography, and falling down probably about where, where uh, Roger is, at least in that general area, and crying like a baby. If you would have happened to walk in here, you'd have said, man, this guy is coming unglued. So I know what that's like. But you know what? You've got to get back up off the floor. You've got to dry the eyes, and you've got to keep walking, not around in this building, but you need to go forward. Life is hard. Becoming a Christian doesn't make life easy. In fact, at times, it makes it more difficult. I love the passage concerning the call of King David. It's when the Spirit of God comes on him that the trouble begins in his life. Did he have any trouble when he was out there shepherding the flock? I mean, he had the occasional bear and, and lion that he had to kill and rip apart with his bare hands. I think there's a man for you. Man, we are lightweights today. We, you know, we shoot him from 300 yards away. <laughs> David just ripped him apart. But it's when the Spirit of God came that he had to run for his life. You see, we do error if we think that the Christian life means ease, comfort and constant uh, problemless existence. In this world, you will have tribulation. Jesus promises in John 16, 33. But be of good cheer, I've, I've overcome the world. If we ask the question, how do we endure? Using the means is a very helpful thing. Using the means, how do we endure? We're an athlete, we use the means. We get up early, we go to bed early, we eat the proper food, we exercise our bodies. We're soldiers, we clean our weapons, we make sure we have a clear line of fire, and we take out the target. If we are farmers, we get up early, because typically that's what you have to do as a farmer. Couldn't they start at eight? I mean, I don't know, I'm not a, not a farmer. Let's get these cows on the cycle of eight-ish. You know, that, that can't be done? I guess not. You've got to get up at three. Why? Because there's something that you need to do. You've got to employ those means. With a Christian life, God hasn't left us alone. He doesn't say endure hardship, and I'm not going to give you any helps. He's given us three helps in this context. He has told, told us to contemplate Christ. He has told us to consider the conduct of Paul. Now he's called us to consider our communion with the Lord Jesus. How do we feed that communion? How do we feed that union? We have Bibles. We have a word from God. We have the truth of Holy Scripture. At some point in your Christian life, you need to come to grips with the reality of Matthew 4. You need to come to grips with the reality of Deuteronomy. 
You need to understand that God is not playing games when he says that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That's not a slogan. That's not a bumper sticker. That's not a fridge magnet. That is your life. It is this word that sustains and nourishes the soul. It is this word that feeds the people of God. It is this word that will keep you, by God's grace, enduring and persevering. How many times have you gone through issues or trials or difficulties or problems and you have found strength in the word? How many times have you read something in Holy Scripture that you said, wow, the Lord has just given me this for an encouragement to my soul? Perhaps you're struggling with temptation. You're struggling with those particular trials. And you read in James 1, blessed is the man who endures trials. The man who resists temptation. Blessed is that particular one. Brethren, the word of God is a means to feed the soul. Prayer. Prayer. How do, we, how do we live the Christian life without prayer? How? How do we possibly think we're going to traverse an evil world, we're going to endure hardship, we're going to persevere through persecution, we're going to go through the struggles of this life without calling upon our Father? All of us as parents know how vital it is for our children to communicate with us. Right? Your children come and say, Mom, Dad, I've got, a, I've got a tooth that's bleeding. All right, let's go take care of you. It's a wretched parent that says, just bleed out. They're going to take him to the dentist because the kid said something. What's Jesus' logic in, God, in the Gospel of Matthew? And as well in the parallel in, Matthew, or in, Luke, in Luke's Gospel. If you then being evil, love to give good gifts to your children, like a trip to the dentist when their mouth is bleeding, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit, guess what, to those who ask? Father, my mouth is bleeding. Please provide for me. Father, I'm going through this difficulty at work. Please provide for me. Father, I don't know how we're going to make ends meet in the budget. Please help me. It is this or one of the means by which we endure. We persevere. This is where we're at. This is what is essential. This is what is necessary. Our hardship is not the hardship in Iraq or Syria. We don't have that problem. Imagine being in Iraq or Syria and coming home to find a note on your door saying, either pay us a great deal of money, convert to Islam, or die. And how, how do you like those options? Our hardships, in many respects, are a lot more tame than that. We need to ponder the glory of God. We need to read his word. We need to pray, and dare I say it, we need to be in church. We need to avail ourselves of the corporate means of grace. God the Lord is pleased to feed his people in places like this, that assemble together for worship, that assemble together for instruction, that assemble together for the supper. You know, the supper is not a reward for our good week. We don't come to the supper because we, we read our Bibles five times this week. Lord, we, we, we didn't say anything vicious to our kids, Lord. We didn't let them bleed out, Lord, so, so I get to take the supper. Do we ever consider the reality of the imagery that the Bible uses? Whose house is the church? It is God's house. Who serves dinner in the house? It is the householder, the house owner. The Lord's Supper is better viewed as a means of grace, a means by which God sends grace to his people through this particular ordinance. We are on the receiving end when it comes to the supper. We are not doing for God. God says, I want to feed you. I want to encourage you. I want to confirm your faith. I want to strengthen you with might in the inner man. And it is my spirit that does that. So please come, take and eat. To say no to that, to disregard that, to miss church on that night, is really an affront to the householder who is spreading out the banquet, who is spreading out the feast. If I spent a Friday night busily preparing a meal, having already invited you, and it comes to 5 p.m., and you say, 
oh, I'm not going to show up, and I'm not even going to call. I'm just not going to be there. You say, oh, man, that's too bad. So I made this great meal. Could have feasted. It would have really encouraged and, and, and nourished you. I'm not saying this as a pastor. Like, I want you to be in church because I'm taking attendance and I'm keeping... That's not it at all. I hope you all know me better than that by now. I just know the direct correlation between a proper use of the means of grace and growth in grace. It is not magic. People who read their Bibles, people who pray, people who go to church typically grow. It's like taking water and pouring it on a seed and putting it under sun. What happens? Typically, it grows. What happens when a man starts reducing his caloric intake and he starts picking up heavy things? He typically loses weight and puts on muscle mass. That's the normal course of, of events. The same is true in the sphere, a spiritual sphere. How do we endure? What is this all about? Pick up your Bible and read it. Pray to your God. Show up in church and run with endurance the race that is set before you. And then notice what Paul holds out in terms of an incentive for this. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. Isn't that beautiful? Again, I think this is part of Paul's argument in the entirety of this section, beginning in 2.3. Beginning in 2.3, what happens? The devoted soldier pleases his commander. That's the reward for the soldier. He's happy because his commander's happy. It's a great analogy. If you're in the military, you know a happy commander means a happy troop. An unhappy commander means a very unhappy troop. There is prize, there is reward for the diligence, or rather the devotion of the soldier with reference to the discipline of the athlete. What happens? He is crowned the victor. What happens with the diligent farmer? He gets to eat the crops. What happens with the Lord Jesus? He suffers, he dies, he goes through that. He's raised the third day. He ascends on high. He led captivity captive. He gives gifts to men. He's stationed at the right hand of the majesty of God on high. You see the pattern. Persevere, endure, slug it out, and there's great benefit at the end. Paul endures all these things for what? For the sake of the elect. Because every time a sinner gets saved, Paul is happy. Every time a sinner gets saved, Paul rejoices. Every time that one of his letters is circulated and it's preached and someone is saved, Paul says it is all worth it to sit in this prison cell, to be forgotten, to be neglected, to be treated like a criminal. It's all worth it because I know that God's elect are coming into the fold. And the same is true with us. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. It's not for nothing. Persevere. Get up. Run the race. Go forward. Those are the encouragements. The believer's union with Christ. The believer's perseverance in Christ. Notice, finally and quickly, the warning. Verses 12b and 13. Paul says, if we deny him, he also will deny us. John Calvin says, a threatening is added for the purpose of shaking off sloth. You see, there's a negative side to this. If you don't get back up, if you don't get back in the race, if you don't run, if you don't persevere, if you don't endure, it is going to evidence something that is true concerning you. Paul says, if we deny him, he also will deny us. The opposite to perseverance, the opposite to endurance, the opposite, of course, is a denial of the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew 10 Verse 32 and 33, Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. And turn to uh, Revelation 21. Revelation 21, specifically verse 8. Revelation 21, verse 8. This is a warning, the end, 
of verse 12. We are to endure. We are to understand that if we endure, we will reign with the Lord Jesus Christ. We will receive that reward. But now, as Calvin said, a threatening is added for the purpose of shaking off sloth. Sloth may be our greatest nemesis when it comes to this whole idea of endurance. Sloth. Laziness. I don't want to fight. I don't want to run. I don't want to train. I don't want to get up early. I don't want to do what the soldier does. I don't want to do what the athlete does. I don't want to do what the farmer does. I just want to, I just want to have it easy. That's why the warning is given here. Notice in Revelation 21.8, but the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake, which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. I think both of the, fir- or the two first terms are captured in our text in 2 Timothy. Notice, cowardly and unbelieving. Cowardly. That's an interesting one. I'm sure some of you in here are afraid of snakes. Some people are afraid of rats. Some people are afraid of heights. Some people are afraid of bears, unless they've got a gun. And even then, it's probably a bit shaky when you're looking at a big bear. Is that what John means here? Cowardly people end up in hell? If I'm afraid of the dark, God's going to throw me into the lake of fire? If I've got a bit of hesitancy to walk into a room where there's a big spider, does that land me a spot in hell? No, cowardly here are the people that didn't follow the admonitions that is at the very end of each of the seven letters to the churches in Asia Minor. Revelation 2 and 3, there are seven uh, seven letters to the seven churches in Asia Minor. Each one of them ends with a promise to him who overcomes. To him who overcomes. To him who overcomes. To him who overcomes. You get the point? Seven times. So when we get to Revelation 21.8, and we see cowardly, we ought not to think spiders. We ought not to think tigers. We ought not to think bears. We ought to think a denial of the Lord Jesus. We have not overcome, we have not endured, we have not persevered, and we have given manifold evidence that we were never saved. That's why the cowardly find themselves in the lake of fire. So back to our text in 2 Timothy. Paul says, if we deny him, he also will deny us. Now notice, if we are faithless, he remains faithful, he cannot deny himself. Now, it's difficult to be dogmatic on verse 13, but here's what I think. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. Some people teach that the wavering, doubting, weak believer will nevertheless find themselves safely folded in the New Jerusalem because Jesus remains faithful. I do believe that's taught in the Bible. I believe that's certainly the instance of Simon Peter. Simon Peter denied his Lord three times. That evidence is a weakness. It evidence is a wavering. It evidence is an unbelief to a certain degree. There was restoration to be sure. So there is biblical warrant for understanding that even the weak believer, the one who has faith, as Machen says, you know, uh, mustard seed faith will not move mountains, but there's one thing it will do. It will bring a soul into peace with God through Jesus Christ. I think that's taught, but I don't think that's taught here. I think two encouragements are rounded out by two warnings. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. To do what? To cast us off. To throw us into the lake of fire. To do what he says in 1033 of Matthew. Whoever denies me, I will deny him before my father. And then the last statement where it says he cannot deny himself underscores by virtue of the character or the nature or the person of our Lord Jesus, and I think specifically in terms of his mediatorial capacity, if we are faithless, he remains faithful, he cannot deny himself. 
If we endure, we shall reign with him. If we do not endure and we do not persevere and we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. There is a certain punishment and judgment in our future, if that is the case. Calvin makes the proper observation. Their base denial of Christ proceeds not only from weakness, but from unbelief. It says, if we are faithless, not little faith in this particular clause. It is faith less. So the promise is to those who endure, those who persevere, those who run with endurance, the race that is set before them, by God's grace to be sure, they will ultimately reign with Jesus Christ. But if we deny Christ, if we are faithless, the language of Revelation 21.8, if we are cowardly and do not overcome, Christ is faithful. Christ is unchanging. Christ who brings blessing and joy and reigning to his beloved is the same faithful one who will cast off those who have rejected him. Well, in conclusion, verse 3 of chapter 2 is the command. We must endure hardship. We must God hasn't left us to ourselves. He's told us to consider his son, to consider his chief apostle, and to consider the communion that is ours with the Lord Christ. And I want to bring this to a close by a very simple question. Are you, are you believing in him or denying him? You see, there's no third place in the passage. We are either in Christ or we are not. We are either dead and raised with him, or we are dead in our trespasses and sins. Ask yourselves tonight, whether you're old, whether you're young, whether you're tall, whether you're short, where am I at? What is the case with my soul? What is happening with me? What do I think concerning Jesus? Is what Paul says here true of me? If we died with him, we shall also live with him. I have a new life in the Lord Jesus. I have been raised from the dead. And by God's grace, I'm enduring. I'm persevering. I'm running. I fall sometimes. I fall a lot. But God in his grace picks me back up. He dusts me off and he sends me back on my merry little way. And I'm running for dear life. Praise God Almighty from whom all blessings flow. But if you're in the latter part of these verses, do you deny Christ? You may not go out and hold up signs. You may not debate James White. You may not say with those atheists that God is not, that Christ is a hoax, but you may deny him by not trusting. You may deny him by resisting the call of the gospel. The gospel is not God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. The gospel is, is that Christ died, Christ was raised the third day, and everyone who believes in him will have everlasting life. That's good news. Do not deny it. Because on that day, those who have denied him will be denied by him in the presence of the Father and of all the holy angels, and they will hear those most accursed words from Matthew's gospel, depart from me. I never knew you. Or depart from me into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. You're either a believer or a denier. And if you're a denier, I plead with you to come to the Lord Jesus to believe the gospel, to be saved. Well, let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you that you not only command enduring hardship, you give us so many good things to consider while we do so. Help us not forget these things. Help us, God, to internalize these things and help us as we face the daily struggles of life that we would do so in a genuinely Christian manner, that we would not throw up our hands, that we would not quit the race, that we would not want to abandon the faith. But God, give us grace to endure, to persevere, to run, and to look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. And we pray these things in his most blessed name. Amen. We'll close with a brief time of meditation and then we'll be dismissed.